Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today we've got a, a great webinar for you. I'm joined by Jennifer Reed, Strategic Solutions Director at Victor Davis, and Ken Hunter, who's a lead network architect, engineer, and technical product manager, who uh, Jen has worked with many times, and I've worked with uh, also at a couple of enterprise accounts. I'm the VP of Product Marketing for Aviatrix, and I'll be doing a short presentation today, and then we'll break into a, uh, a, a panel discussion. So the, uh, see, the, the agenda for today looks like this. I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of background about Aviatrix, because many of you joining today probably are not familiar with Aviatrix. Uh, so we'll talk about what, you know, enterprise customers are telling us. We'll talk a little bit about our multi-cloud network architecture and the platform that delivers some of these capabilities. And then we'll, we'll give you a quick run through of sort of how Aviatrix works. And that'll give you enough background so that the panel discussion makes a lot of sense because we're gonna, we'll talk about uh, many of the things that we're seeing out at enterprise customers, both from from our perspective as a vendor, but also uh, from a managed services provider, Victor Davis's perspective, and then also from the actual practitioner who's out there doing a lot of this uh, in Ken Hunter. Uh, then we'll finalize everything up with uh, some question and answers and next steps that you guys can take uh, if you're interested in learning more. So let me just start a little bit with uh, Aviatrix. I'll, I'll do this sort of from the customer perspective. These are enterprise customers who are basing their cloud network architecture on Aviatrix. And you can see that we're really a horizontal play in enterprises uh, uh, across the world uh, from technology companies that are basing their backends with, with our, our network infrastructure to financial services and retail, travel and hospitality, manufacturing, and so on. So lots of customers who are doing this out there today. I think we're approaching about 500 customers at this point. Now, one of the things that we hear from customers all the time is that they need more than just the basic networking and security capabilities. I mean, you've all kind of been on this journey with all of us uh, in, in your careers where you've seen the kind of enterprise data center networking that was originally based on an architecture from Cisco. And then that changed a little bit as things started getting virtualized. And so you had a virtual network infrastructure, but you always had access to the underlying physical infrastructure and the virtual infrastructure that that networking was based on. As things have moved to the cloud, I think we've changed a little bit. As customers, you don't have actual access to the underlying physical or virtual infrastructure. You only have access to the cloud networking constructs that AWS or Azure, or Google, Oracle expose to you. And so this is where we play, where the new data center is now the, uh, the, the cloud. We are delivering enterprise class multi-cloud networking and security that works across all of the clouds. So that, that is kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Now, the other thing that we hear from these, uh, these customers is the enterprise class capabilities they're looking for include big time visibility, the ability to see what's going on, real time network uh, data and dynamics. And the cloud providers will tell you that they have all of this capability, but not really there. And that's some of the things that we'll, we'll talk about. There's limited troubleshooting capability in the cloud, you no know, packet capture and ping, trace route, some of the things that you're used to on-prem. And there's a lack of control for all of the networking capabilities, high availability and encryption and traffic engineering, network correctness, some of the things that, that our system delivers. And in the end, customers are looking for a multi-cloud network architecture, a way to sort of frame what they're trying to build so that they can build a plan and then go from there. And that includes things like multi-cloud infrastructure as code, giving you the ability to really move from any kind of manual operations into an automated operation that allows you to have a repeatable sort of pod-like delivery of 
infrastructure no matter what cloud you're in. And all of this, we, we hear that there's a lot of complexity and skills gap. And that's whether that's for a single cloud or multi-cloud, because as people are moving from on-prem into the cloud, things change. And if you finally figure it out for, let's say, AWS, but now you need to do the same thing in Azure, you now need to learn a whole lot of new complexity. So there's a lot more to this, but we hear this all the time from customers that they need kind of enterprise class networking and security. Now, we deliver this in a way that has an architecture around it. So you can see here uh, that we build an architecture that's single or multiple clouds. It takes into consideration security across all of the cloud layers and operations across all the cloud layers. So you have the access layer, which is how your data center or your branch offices or your users are going to access things in the cloud. Then you have the network layer, which is actually how everything is communicating in the cloud, and then the application layer. So we're delivering that enterprise class visibility, full control, advanced networking and security and multi-cloud optionality in that network layer. And this is where our transit becomes the foundation of this architecture because it's where the application layer is connecting into, it's where the access layer is connecting into, and it goes across all of the clouds in a way that is repeatable and, and manageable in the, in the same way. And we do this with our cloud network platform. So I won't go in all the details here, but essentially the platform is what's delivering the advanced network services, the advanced security services, the advanced operational services, and doing things like service insertion to be able to bring in next generation firewall capabilities from our partners, our SD-WAN connections, or uh, operational tools like Splunk and Sumo Logic, Datadog, bringing those in, into this environment as well. Now, one of the things I want to make clear is that we're not, our platform is not a SaaS or a managed service. It's actually software that you buy and install on your cloud instances. And some of the key components here that I want you to visualize and understand how this comes together. Number one is the, the Aviatrix controller. And you can think about this as the brain of the operations. It's talking to our own gateways, which provide the advanced networking and security capabilities. But it's also talking through API to the native cloud constructs and to other tools from our partners, for instance, the, the next generation firewalls here. And this ability to talk to the native constructs and other uh, services in the cloud allows you to create an abstraction layer. And this abstraction layer is where we deliver our multi-cloud Terraform provider, meaning that we have the ability to automate in multiple clouds by abstracting the complexities of each one of those clouds because our controller is actually talking to and understanding the languages of each cloud. Then all of this feeds into our visualization tool uh, we call Copilot. Co and this platform allows you to do things like build a multi-cloud topology map showing you how everything is connected. And this is dynamic. And as you know, in the cloud, things change all the time. So being able to see how things have changed is very important. It also gives you flow analytics and the ability to drill down and troubleshoot exactly what's happening in the cloud. And of course, the overall dashboard of what's, what's on, what's happening, what's up and down in, in the cloud as well. So let's walk quickly through how this actually kind of comes together when it's deployed. And it typically with our customers starts in a single cloud, but you can see it's a hub and spoke architecture giving you the ability to bring your on-prem into the cloud and then connect your resources in the cloud with a uh, highly available equal cost multi-path network infrastructure with end-to-end -end encryption and use, utilizing the controller to do network correctness to make sure, for instance, you're not doing overlapping IP addresses or CIDRs, for instance. And this can be expanded into another region and you see it's a repeatable architecture. So the same transit uh, hub and spoke architecture that you had in region one is now in region two. And then, of course, from a multi-cloud standpoint, you want to be able to repeat that in a pod-like deployment. So now I can deploy that in AWS, in Azure, in Google, 
in Oracle, and I can start in any of them and go to any other cloud. So whatever your primary cloud is, that's where your controller would run. And then we add high performance encryption. So many people want to use high performance encryption across the connection from the data center into the cloud where we can deliver wire speed capability, meaning that we can take advantage of the full, for instance, 10 gig of your direct connect or express route connection, but do that with IPsec encryption. And then inside the cloud, we can go up to 75 gig um, Intra, intra cloud so that you have connections that you want that high speed connect, connections to, we can do that. The next thing is multi cloud network segmentation. Now, this is a really powerful capability in giving the ability to create security domains. So, in this case, for instance, the blue dots can talk to the blue dots, green dots can talk to the green dots but the blue dots can't talk to the green dots. So this gives you the ability to go across clouds and set this up. So for instance, you can create your production environments that everything can talk to, or your dev test environments that everything to talk to. And you can have shared environments as well. For instance, the purple dot here could represent a shared environment that both blue and green could talk to. And then we do service insertion and, and, and chaining here where we can bring in next generation firewalls, SD-WAN connections, and so forth, and connect those into this, uh, this multi-cloud backbone very easily and give you very high performance in terms of the capabilities that those, those products provide. And finally, this feeds into this, this visualization platform that I talked about, Copilot, so that all of the data across all of these, this network in each one of the cloud is providing you a common operational view and ability to troubleshoot, which is very powerful in what all enterprises are looking for today. Then once you have a multi-cloud backbone, of course, you want to connect things to it. So we have services that allow you to connect your uh, users, your remote users, your remote sites, connect to the internet, make sure that connections to, to and from the internet are secure, and extend that, that, um, that network segmentation that I talked about out to those locations as well. And then finally, we support cloud native infrastructure. So if you're running, for instance, an AWS Transit Gateway and you want to connect those into this multi-cloud backbone, we can do that. Although you won't get all of the benefits of the Aviatrix Transit Network when you do that, we do provide that capability and we speak to all of the native capabilities in, in, the, in the, each one of the clouds. So in the end, what we're doing is we're bringing the simplicity and automation that everybody is expecting from cloud, but also delivering the visibility and enterprise class control that people are looking for. So the visibility in our products like Copilot and FlightPath to be able to do visualization and troubleshooting and the control, which is really about the advanced services, the advanced networking, security and automation services that we have and the ability for you to actually control them. So you can see when something's happening, what's going wrong, and actually have the ability to do something about it. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and we'll jump to uh, the panel here. And we will, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can get the larger uh, video pictures here and we'll, we'll sort of get going just a second. Let me, I gotta stop sharing here and then. So, on this panel, I'm really excited to have Jen Reed, who is the Strategic Solution Director at Victor Davis, and Ken Hunter, who is a senior consulting network architect, who Jen's worked with closely in you know, many, many different uh, uh, opportunities. Um, the most recent one, I think, was a uh, multinational company that had all the enterprise requirements that we're talking about. So I'm, I'm really excited to have both of their perspectives on, on today's panel. Um, if we can, maybe I can start with you. If you give us, uh, you know, a little bit about, you know, your background, your journey to the cloud, maybe a little bit about your experience on prem and how that's sort of transitioned to the cloud. Maybe some of your recent experience and so forth that you have uh, <clears throat> going on with Aviatrix. Yeah, thank you, Rod. Um, 
so yeah, I've been a network architect with a focus mainly on the WAN side during my career. So I've worked with a lot of large corporations, both as an employee and as a consultant. Um, sorry about the fire whistle in the background. I hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> Murphy's He's in Lord. Delaware. <laughs> um, yeah. um, it should end shortly here. Just give me a second. And you may hear my dog howling as well. So uh, We can still hear you fine. We, yeah, we can hear you pretty good, Ken. So you, you can keep going. Yeah. Um, so again, I've been an employee and I worked as a consultant for, um, you know, financial institutions from Wall Street, uh, major publishers uh, on the retail side and hospitality as well. And I've architected solutions that provided connectivity to mainframes, distributed systems, PBXs, and now, of course, the cloud. Um, from a hardware perspective, in regards to networking, I've worked with equipment from Cisco, Synoptics, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Nortel, a lot of others. And, um, you know, on the telecommunication, telecommunication side, I worked with everything from point to point, you know, and there's always an evolution, right? Then you have IPsec, Frame Relay, MPLS, Ethernet-based circuits. And, you know, in the early days, we had a lot of hub and spoke traffic that traversed to the data center. Um, it's most of the traffic was hitting mainframes or server farms, internet VPNs, PBXs, and they were all located on-prem for the most part. Um, so with the introduction of MPLS, um, you could communicate directly, you know, with the, with the MPLS cloud, right? And you routed at the edge, so it was great. Um, uh, my first venture into cloud was with uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, followed by AWS and then Oracle. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, once you get into one cloud, it's, you know, you're usually hopping into multi-cloud, you know, with, with um, other vendors. So, you know, our, my journey, it started out as a test bed for an application and, you know, the company wanted to see how it performed, right? So the initial connectivity, you know, like a lot of other companies started out with IPsec and, but, you know, there was a lot of trial and error, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. the terminology that the, the cloud vendors were using, so me as a network engineer, it was, it was kind of foreign to me. And things that they called certain devices, you know, it wasn't what I was used to, you know? So, um, so then, um, you know, the various application teams wanted to stand up some servers, so they went about doing that. And then they did some testing and, you know, it, it quickly morphs into a production application migrating to the cloud, right? Yep. So then, uh, you know, it starts out small, but, you know, once your management gets a feel for the agility that cloud afforded you, you know, it, the, the usage ramps up quick, you know. This is when, you know, new projects are proposed. We were told, you know, consider cloud first, right? Make that the first choice and instead of standing up something in the data center again, right? So... Um, you know, management's all in at that point. Um, so, you know, and it doesn't surprise me is because if you've ever worked with outsources, you know, you're hard pressed to stand up hardware quickly, right? There's all the blue tape, getting new equipment, the, the management, the teams, the, uh, you know, dispatching people on site. It, it, there's, there's a lot of work involved with that. And, you know, it could take up to six weeks or more just to stand up a server. So now you can go you know, to cloud and spin up a server, what, in a couple of minutes. So it's, so it's, it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, then what happens is before you know it, you know, you, 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 you outgrow the IPsec solution and you're looking for higher speeds. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you start going to direct connect and, um, you know, that type of solution. <clears throat> you know, then you start adding VPCs and then multi-clouds. And then if, if you have sister companies, right, or if you're an international company, now you, you, you soon realize that, you know, they've been on the same journey as you have been on, right? So they've started out with cloud and, you know, you may not have communicated with them and it may have started out small and a couple of little applications. And so before you know it now, the company wants everybody's clouds to communicate together, right? And that's where a lot of the complexity comes in. And, um, you know, then, then, you know, that's when you realize that, you know, this cloud is here to stay, right? You know, as so... You know, and as far as like branch offices go, <clears throat> you know, you know, if you're in MPLS, you know, a lot of the branch offices are already on the cloud. And like I mentioned earlier, you're routing with the cloud. So, you know, cloud becomes just another data center, if you will, or another, um, 
you know, um, it's any, another node off of the cloud, like a big yeah. corporate center or something. And, uh, but, but keep in mind, you know, you, you're probably going to start off with a hybrid environment. If you're a substantial company and, and you have a lot of, um, you know, a big data center, and especially if you have a mainframe, right? The one thing they haven't figured out yet, and they're probably working on it, how do I get the mainframe in the cloud, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> As so some people the, think the cloud is the new mainframe. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, you know, years ago, I was at Cisco Networkers with uh, Chambers and a couple of other guys, and they said, you know, the mainframe's going away, it's dead. And I'm talking, you know, 15, 20 years ago and everything's gonna be distributed and everybody realized that well, it's kind of a headache to support all these different devices now where mainframe was very centric, you know, but um, again, things have evolved. And, and so that's kind of been my journey to the cloud. And, and as you mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of similarities with companies that um, you, you all have the same type of, of challenges, you know, um, yeah. and, and getting over that hump. And, and, and I know, Rod, we've had conversations in the past um, from, from an understanding of, of traditional networking and now cloud is radically different, you know. So um, how do you bridge that gap? And, and, and I'll tell you, Victor Davis was uh, pivotal in you know a couple of companies I worked for in, in bridging that gap you know they have expertise on both sides and um, you know from a traditional network engineer it can be daunting at cloud right and and I wasn't used to you know what's an EC2 instance and what's a, a bucket and pipelines and you know I was like Jen help me out here I, I you know I, I I'm always used to providing the highway right you know I can build the highway and, and but you know you find that you know, you need to, to start to understand, you know, where all these networking components, what do they fit in the, in the cloud? And, and, you know, what are the equivalents of a traditional data center? And I would have been lost without Jen. I was just like, I, I, I don't know what they're asking for here. You know, yeah, get the connectivity up and running. That's not a problem, right? Yeah. But then when you start looking at the access controls and the visibility and, and all my networking tools aren't working, and that's where Aviatrix comes in, right? it's a commonality of all these tools that, that you're used to ping and then they reintroduce BGP. You know, if you just work with the native constructs of a cloud vendor, you don't know what they're using for a routing protocol. You know, you know, maybe at the edge, you know, I'm passing routes with them, but what's going on inside the cloud. Right. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and again, this is where, you know, a Victor Davis and Aviatrix, it, it's a, it's a one, two punch it really is. And, um, it makes you feel more comfortable, you know, getting into that environment, you know. And, yeah, that's, that's, that's great background. Thanks a lot, uh, yeah. Ken. It sounds like you've got some really good experience there, both with, you know, networking uh, through, through uh, as it grew up, and then trying to leverage that experience as you, as you go into the cloud and, you know, recognizing that the cloud providers are telling you they can do everything and, and then finding out, hey, I, I don't have a lot of the tools that I had before. Absolutely. Let me, let me jump to, to Jen. Uh, you know, Jen, are there, you know, there's other areas. I mean, we, we talked to, Ken talked a lot of, about networking and so forth. Are there other things that you're seeing, you know, enterprise IT customers finding challenging as they're moving to the cloud? Yeah, I think it's always that speed to value uh, versus security compliance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and it's really a delicate balance to figure out how do I really enable uh, the business to move forward as fast as they want to move forward without opening them up to compromising their customer data. Mm. And, and at BQD, we work with our customers um, in, in a lot of sensitive environments, whether they're meeting global compliance programs like PCI or, you know, regional ones like the US HIPAA or privacy protections like GPDR in EU and CCPA in California to really ensure that the network infrastructure uh, supports all of those frameworks for isolation, encryption, and protection. And um, I think what's really important is that you need to think about those constraints um, and what that has for each provider because a lot of them are independently, you know, in compliance, but that's just if you use that in isolation and not actually how you connect it, right? 
because the individual cloud providers say, well, it was PCI, as long, and, but you're responsible for keeping it all safeguarded. But, you know, we, we followed the bare minimum of that because we don't have direct access, right? Since we don't have direct access to your data or data going in and out, therefore we're good, so it's up to you. And I think really being able to uh, work with the customer so that um, you can really provide those common components is really important. How do I, I put those together into an underlying transit fabric that meets those credentials, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being able to really stabilize across all cloud platforms, because each one's different, right? And so one of the keys to making that happen and getting that speed while also trying to uh, make sure we're meeting the requirements in those sensitive environments is really having Aviatrix as a core part of that. I mean, one of the great things that we have found is from day one, the controller had no vulnerabilities, right? And some of the other ones like the gateways, you know, initially, you know, had some really, really low level ones, but I was like, nope, not in my environment. Some of the, the people I work with, if it has anything wrong with it, they're going to say no. Yeah, and, and, and we got to that level of iteration. Every couple of weeks, you guys are double checking for me. You know, is there a new vulnerability out on Ubuntu that we're affected by? And if so, it rolls into the next uh, update. And that kind of um, uh, commitment to both security and flexibility and agility that Aviatrix releases really helps give confidence so that when we're doing our double check before we deploy, we don't have to open a support ticket to say, hey, we found this thing. But it, it's just really important because you got to meet both, right? Everyone thinks that, um, you know, the security team is just slowing me down. But if you sit down and really understand what that stakeholder wants and also what the business wants, making sure that you can overlay those two and give that agility and give them the ability, because guess what? If we released it and met all those needs, right, it reduces my audit time, right? Because now I have all the documentation and when we do the, you know, testing, it's not going, you know, to have the same issues as if we try to ignore it, right? So yep. I think that's, you know, one of the things that enterprise IT is constantly thinking about, especially as they're moving more and more to the cloud. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and thanks for highlighting the fact that our engineering team really tries to stay up with all of those because I hear it all the time, uh, shared responsibility from the, uh, the, the cloud providers, which really means it's your responsibility. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we try to keep up with it. And let me jump to Ken. Uh, Ken, you know, do you think that the experience you had in networking on-prem has really helped you a lot in, in the, as you move to cloud or is really learning cloud uh, kind of the most complicated part of it? Yeah, so the on-prem knowledge definitely has helped. And because uh, remember, you, you still have all the same devices, you know, in the cloud that you're seeing in the data center, right? You have your load balancers, your firewalls, your routing, your switching, et cetera. And, you know, Learning cloud may seem easy because there's a lot of GUI front ends and, and um, you know, um, but if, if you're anything like me, you want to learn, you know, what's actually going on under the covers, right? Um, and, and I don't know if it's that my analytical mind, you know, trying to, trying to learn more about what's going on, but, you know, you, you, again, the constructs that are provided to you from the cloud providers, um, you know, they're not telling you everything that they're doing or the secret sauce and, and um, you know, they won't tell you what's going on, you know, no matter how much you ask them, they just say, this is the way it is. And, you know, why do you have a limitation on prefixes, a number of prefixes? Oh, that's just how it works. And, you know, so, so again, um, you know, being able to use tools like Aviatrix, it, it puts you back in the driver's seat, right? Because it, it, it allows you to overcome some of these limitations that they impose on you, you know, and at the end of the day, you'll be called upon to troubleshoot an issue. And yep. uh, remember, just because when you're in the cloud, it doesn't mean that the application folks still aren't going to say it's a network issue. So <laughs> again, you better have the tools to plead your case. Right. That's um, right. And, and as Jen mentioned earlier, right. You, you still have your security um, governance and, and your PCI and your compliancy and, and Jen's right. I'll tell you, 
A couple of companies I worked for, uh, the security teams are very stringent. And uh, when you bring a new product in on board, you better make sure it passes, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's passed at all the, the, the different compliances. And, um, you know, like Jen said, Aviatrix passed out the gate and, and that's a rarity. And, and I'll tell you, I, I've been surprised. I've, you know, worked with some banks and, and you would think that, oh my God, you would think a bank is so compliant. Uh, you know, they're dealing with my money and everything. And, and you know, and, and a lot of times you, you don't find that, you know, even connecting up with them as third party type of customer. So, so it's refreshing that uh, Aviatrix is, is really up to date, but it, you know, it doesn't surprise me because I, you know, and, and Rod, we spoke about this a little bit, you know, Aviatrix, I think, was formed and founded by networking people. I mean, big names in the industry, right? So, you know, they're aware of what your needs are, and um, they help you facilitate that as you start to, you know, venture into the cloud. And, um, you know, the tools are fantastic. So, yeah, great. Can you, we, we hear it a lot from uh, customers who basically say, look, I can't deal with a black box somebody is gonna call me out and say it's the network. And I, when the rubber hits the road, it, it is my responsibility. I'm managing this, uh, the operations of our cloud. So I can't just point the finger back to AWS or Azure. I have to have the tool set that I need to, 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 to respond. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Jen and myself, we good cop, bad cop, AWS a few times on some calls and, you know, <laughs> You don't get that far. They just, they will not divulge what's going on. And so, you know, you got to work with what you got. And, you know, Aviatrix has come up with some tools that they can do that effectively. But like you said, all the stuff's transiting, you know, your, your gateways and, and your controllers capturing that information and, and uh, it allows you to use it in a very effective way. And, you know, um, you, know you, you mentioned earlier about cloud constructs and, and, you know, there's a limited toolbox there and they may be coming out with newer stuff right um but but they're no near nowhere near what aviatrix is doing today so um, yeah. it, it yes. really helps a lot you know so jen you know looking all right we, we're talking about ken from a, a networking coming from the networking experience do you see people that have sort of the devops perspective having an easier time sort of getting into cloud or uh, and, and especially dealing with network and so forth or, or, or just as challenging? Well, let's put it this way. There's hubris that they don't have the challenges <laughs> because I can click a button and it deploys, right? And so, which is great, you know, so you got that agility. I can do some MVPs, I can do some POCs, right? But at the same time, um, they're thinking of it from top down, right? And right. so I'm deploying, I've got my stuff to happen and really networking and even stuff like DNS, it's just the magic stuff that happens, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's like one of my favorite things is like I had a, a, an application team come to me and say, hey, when we deploy this microservices stuff, we won't have to worry about networking anymore. And I was like, yeah, right. You don't, I do. Right. So um, because what you end up happening is you have two teams. They're going to go and deploy into their own accounts and into their own VPCs. And guess what? They'll magically use the same damn ciders, you know, and they're like, I would like to connect these two. And then I also want to connect it to on-prem. And you're like, yeah, that's a problem. Uh, right? that's gonna, yeah. <laughs> they're like, why is that a problem? Right. And it's just because you're approaching the, you're approaching it very differently. I mean, because these type of fundamentals of how the network works, you know, it's something a long time ago we used to have to learn. And by a long time ago, I'm just, you know, right out of college, you know, 20 years ago, you had to make the network work. You didn't have a network. There wasn't a cloud that you could just deploy and learn in that the networking, the base default networking worked. You had to learn how that worked. Yeah. But now it's not there. And so that's like, it's, it's different, but it's also challenging because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So, and so you get a mess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I guess that, that kind of leads into another question maybe for Ken, you know, as, a, as an architect, you know, how important do you see architecture, right? I mean, what, what Jen was just talking about is you sort of maybe get some chaos as the DevOps guys are able to take advantage of the basic networking, but as soon as that spreads out and you want kind of a more architectural approach to things, it, it kind of looks like chaos to, 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 
to somebody coming in trying to put an architecture in place? Do you, do you see people actually trying to put an architecture in place first or most of the time are you trying to get your arms around this sort of chaos uh, without an architecture? Yeah, I mean, there's, Rod, there's a little bit of both. I mean, if you have the luxury, you know, plan it out and, and, and definitely assume that if you build it, they will come. So try to size it correctly, uh, you know, not only for the present, you know, whatever application you're looking at at the time, but, you know, for the future as well. And, and you know, I could say having a company like Victor Davis to be used as a soundboard and to share some of the, their experiences is very valuable to you, you know. Um, it, it becomes fast moving and, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about this route, about the ad hoc requests that will come in and, you know, and um, we've also talked about how your, your aviatrix products can assist in this area. Um, if I had used some of the, you know, some adjectives here, you know, it would be, you know, you want to have repeatability, simplicity, supportability and sustainability, you know, and, and that's the goal from an architecture perspective, right? So um, one of my biggest compliments as an architect is if somebody on the operation side does not know who I am, that tells me I designed a sound solution and it hasn't had a lot of issues, right? So yeah, it's always, going, right? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and, you know, Jen can attest to that. So, um, you know, again, there's going to be a lot of things to think about and, and you don't know right out the gate. You know, like I said, it starts out small, but <clears throat> you build it and people start to get a feel for it and the agility for it. And it, it just explodes. And Jen can attest to that. Right. So, you know, and Jen knows, you know, what other companies experience and she's been through this before, right? It, it's nothing new. Um, there seems to be a, a common set of steps that, that happen, right? You know, it starts out small, it, it starts growing and, and, you know, you, you better get a good handle on it. Right. And, yeah. you know, Again, the aviatrix tool gives you that commonality, especially across multiple clouds. So could you imagine, I just learned AWS and now I got to go to Google or <laughs> Oracle or I got to learn Microsoft Azure. And, and, and you know, again, <clears throat> you remember, a lot of this stuff was built by, you know, people who were more application centric and, and you know, they, they use scripting languages. They live, eat and breathe it. So you know, that's what you're seeing on the front end. You're not seeing what's going on underneath. So, you know, to me, Aviatrix brings that architecture back to something that, you know, you, you're, is relatable to you and you can understand and, and, and use and, and, and I mean, puts their own flavor on it and allows you to do things that you can't do in the cloud. And if you can do them in the cloud, it's not easy. And, and again, I go back to the simplicity and the repeatability, you know, th this is what Aviatrix brings to the table. And as far as, you know, experience, I mean, Victor Davis, um, you know, it, it's been very positive. And, and, you know, without them, I think uh, on a couple of counts, I would have stumbled big time and, and made a lot of mistakes. And those mistakes can be costly. And it, it's just sure. like when you have, um, you know, a, a corporate center, and then now you're migrating another customer in or a sister company, or you buy another company and you have overlapping addresses, you know, the effort it is to change that, right? These sure. things can happen in the cloud like that, right? So, you know, again, having the right tools and the experience and will save you time, money and, and aggravation. So, right. yeah, I'll get this for so Jen, back, back to you, you know, you've, you've seen the Victor Davis, you know, business practice around cloud really sort of accelerate here. You know, where do you find your expertise is most needed? And, you know, do you find that you've run into some beliefs that you need to overcome or tell us a little bit about the cloud practice there? Well, I think um, since we do operate a lot in um, areas for um, privacy is important, uh, sensitivity of the data, there's a big fear of going to cloud in a lot of those areas. And really because on-prem, there have been a lot of um, security and controls put in place um, to uh, protect the data. Um, I mean, of course, uh, things happen and uh, you know, there's been intrusions and exfiltration of data. And so the, the, for them, the thought of going to the cloud and the public cloud has great fear, right? And so working with them to understand what those concerns are and bring 
governance and best practices into place without disrupting anything becomes really important. Um, so they can actually go um, uh, begin that journey to actually move out to the cloud and do so in a way um, that provides uh, the controls that they need. On the other hand, we've had customers rush out into the cloud and then gotten themselves into a big mess, right? And so they're once again creating and really understanding where they're trying to go and uncovering all the skeletons in the closet, right? <laughs> Tell me everything you've done. Let me look at those policies, you know, let me look at the security groups. Let me get over the heart attack I just had, you know, let's put some controls on your S3 and then really talk about where they want to get to. And I think one of the things that always accelerates that is really trying to get to the, understand sim the simplicity of what they need, right? Where their big um, areas of concerns are. For some customers, some of that concern may be that they really don't have a lot of governance to really understand where their sensitive data is, right? Um, and so helping them through that journey, in addition to securing the data, also, they might not really understand if they have unstructured data. Is, is any of that sensitive? They have no clue, right? Yep. As well as understanding how can they move. And we've had customers shut down data centers and move them whole hawk to the cloud. So how do you get that to happen in a way that's most cost effective, right? And really walking through each of those to make sure that those types of um, controls are are in place, but really making it simple and creating a roadmap with achievable objectives that are measurable and demonstrable to the business so they can continue on that journey. Because otherwise, if you pick something that is pie in the sky, it doesn't have any real value associated with it. You might get that one project finished, right? But you might not be able to continue on to actually prove to the business that met those expectations, right? And some of it also means appropriately accounting for cost, right? <laughs> How much is this going to cost me, right? Um, and really making sure you understand that uh, so you can make those trade-offs in business case. Um, but at the end of the day, whether someone is small or they're an existing um, enterprise that has a big mess on its hands, really sitting down to understand where they are, where they're trying to get to and get them there without disrupting anything has always been key. Yep. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're right. I mean, simplicity is one of the key value propositions of cloud. And, and, and that means that you're not having to sort of manage complexity. You're actually making things more simple. Uh, and you see that in the compute and application automation that people have already done. Ken, let me ask you, you know, from a network perspective, you know, what's your perspective on simplicity there? Uh, you know, as, as you approach it from uh, the network side of things. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic networking is, it, you know, sure, it's simple, right? Uh, within a VPC, uh, basic connectivity, you have direct VPC peering. It, it, it's all pretty easy, right? But it's manual provisioning in most cases, right? So AWS and other cloud providers would like you to believe that it remains simple. Right. But networking, you know, the networking component, I should say, quickly gets much more complex. And, and the cloud providers, they fall short on delivering the control and visibility that most enterprise networking teams are accustomed to, you know, seeing on premise. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so let me clarify that last comment. You know, networking teams shouldn't simply strive to simply bring legacy on prem operation processes to the cloud. Rather, they should look to you know, leverage and embrace new cloud network capabilities and architectural approach, right? Like Aviatrix, uh, you know, they have emerged for the cloud and will maintain the simplicity and automation everyone expects from the cloud, but empower IT teams with the enterprise class control and visibility needed to efficiently operate on an enterprise class cloud network, right? So that, that's key, right? Yeah, and, yeah. So. yeah, and I agree. Um, because you are gonna start with those basic networking services, right? And maybe for small businesses, that makes sense, right? At the same time, even for small businesses, say you're relying on a virtual gateway. And Ken and I, we run into this problems even on the large, for large customers, but for small ones too, if you have an issue, right? You can't, you can't do a packet capture. You can't intercept the traffic on a virtual gateway within the transit gateway 
within a Direct Connect gateway. You can try to put it in the same VPC to try to capture pa packets, but you can't put yourself in between, say, an RDS instance and, and a virtual gateway, right? Because you're routing through a network load balancer and then going to the VGW. You can't get in the middle, right? So that starts to get to become really problematic on day two. Because yes, there is tooling in some providers to allow you to actually see that all the connections should be there and your route tables are, should, are updated and everything looks fine. But I, I could tell you that too. Everything looks fine. It should be working. I don't know why it's dropping packets, right? And mm -hmm. so the key there is like, okay, what do I do now, right? And so like that simplicity, like you don't think about it until something's not working, right? Exactly. And whether it's a big large corporation where that could be billions of transactions or you're a small business um you know that could be all that could be your margin going down the twos because i'm losing those those transactions right yeah. still yeah. equally critical but the fact that i can't see that i mean that's why we have some of our small we have smaller companies in which we do host their aviatrix solutions for them so we can provide those capabilities on the smaller end where we have our managed services, where we actually provide similar services, but on companies uh, or enterprises, corporate AWS account network and framework, which is where Ken and I have worked a lot. Yeah, yeah. I would just add um, that, you know, when you're dealing with a hybrid environment, right? You, you know, you're going from the cloud, maybe your data center, so you're transiting in and out. And like Jen said, you know, you need to know the full path of the data, right? And, and, you know, where is it failing is you can't just say, oh, it must be the cloud because we never had that problem on prem, you know, but yeah, what, where is it a load balancer? Is it, you know, is it a firewall? Is it an access control? I mean, you have to really have a handle on all these different areas in the network that the traffic traverses, you know, it's just like a traditional network, right? But now you have cloud and it's an alternate data center. And like Jen says, we, we've been called out like, you know, it's broke. Where is it? Where's the problem? There's latency. Things are dropping. Da, 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 right. da. You know, there's a lot of things to look at. So, yeah. you know, back to the on-prem experience, you know, Jen has a lot of it. I myself, you know, especially when you're dealing with hybrid, you, you need to understand, you know, I, I, you'd be hard pressed to personally take somebody off the street who just started with cloud, throw them into an environment like that and Where's the problem? You know, oh, I don't know. Let me click. You know, I mean, you, let me open an AWS support case. Well, that's that's the thing. You, you know, so but, it 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 really helps. Yeah, but to have let's let's be clear, them. right? The, these guys have built probably I don't know the the most robust underlying infrastructure network infrastructure in the history of computing, right? That's no small task. But really, the problem comes with what they're exposing to you as users, right? right. So it's, it's those networking constructs <laughs> that are the challenge to deal with when you're trying to do things uh, at an enterprise class level. Right. And at the same time, they do yeah. fail. So they do tout we have, you know, five nines reliability. But at the end of the day, sometimes those virtual devices are the problem, right? And being able to prove to them, it, they are the problem, you know, is an issue um, until you can either take them out of the equation or provide them proof. And that's key to one of the things that Aviatrix gives you the ability to do is provide that proof quickly, right, to resolve that issue. And I think that's the key is that even though they do provide world-class networks, it does not mean they are without failure. Because going to cloud doesn't mean that that you're going to never experience failures that you had in the data center. What it means is you should plan for failure, right? That's key, is planning for that failure. And so that means whenever you're going through a virtual device, how do I detect that? And if I see an issue with it, how do I route around it, right? I mean, that's what you're used to doing on the on-prem. And that should be the mindset when you're going to cloud is not that it won't fail, it's how do I detect that failure and how do I plan for that failure? And Aviatrix is another tool in the toolbox to help you plan for that failure. Yeah, and true. Jen is so right about that, right? You know, um, having a tool like Aviatrix to, to be able to look at the traffic at these various points, right? Because 
to Jen's point earlier, you can't go to AWS to open up a case and say, we're seeing an issue. What is the problem here? You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's just like any other scenario. You can't assume that it's one particular component, right? So yeah. having that extra visibility and analytics to look at the traffic from both ends is invaluable because you'll need to, you know, again, plead your case and say, well, this is what we see. This is when it left. This is when it's coming back. And, and that becomes critical because like Jen mentioned earlier, when you have that black box in the middle, right? And you can only see up to a certain point, you know, you better be on your game to know what's when things are transiting in and out of the environments. Right. And, and Rod, you've been around for a long time. You know, there's that always holy war of application. It's the network, it's the application. You know, you're lucky to have someone like Jen that knows both sides, right? That can yep. hang with you with the networking piece and also knows the analytics and the applications and can, you know, go against the security guys and, and all these other things. So I don't uh, go know. against them. Well, <laughs> I give them what they need. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so you <laughs> you really need you really need the visibility that you guys are talking about to oh, be able to see what the problem is, but you kind of also need the control to do something about it. Because as you mentioned, you know, you can't just say, "Hey, I'm seeing something. Can you do something about it?" Because they'll say, "Well, I'm not sure what you know. It's on your side, right?" We're so, not seeing it. yeah, right. You know, yeah. this is but but the control world word gets thrown around a lot, right? And we want to make sure everybody understands that we're not talking about that sort of central IT control that you know, in some sense may have driven shadow IT, you know, mm -hmm. around corporate IT and into the cloud, you know, I don't think anybody wants to slow things down, right? Well, Ken, you, mm -hmm. are you seeing that? Exactly. I mean, look, um, the whole point is that no one wants to slow things down. But we're, what we're really talking about, you know, is day two operations, you know, because once everything is up and great, and it's running, but you know, if you haven't architected for both the control and visibility, um, that's when, you know, I'm going to get a Slack message in the middle of the night or a phone call, you know, for someone saying, I have a SEV1, what happened? You know, and it's up to me to figure out what the hell is going on, right? And so most of the time, it really isn't my problem. It really isn't. But because I, you know, have Aviatrix, uh, you know, and the visibility and control in place, I can actually probably figure out what the problem is in about a minute, right? In about a minute, right? It's like, and I could tell them it's this, right? At the same time, I mean, I'm just gonna, I know you talked about Terraform and it's great, right? But I love your REST, REST API. And I'm just gonna a little shout out about it uh, because there used to not be a Terraform provider, uh, but we've written a lot of serverless functions that leverage that um, API. And what we do is that when we notice that there's an issue, I have a health alert, I have something that's not responding the way that it should, right? And we can pull those um, from the controller because it has those health alerts coming in. Like I could trigger them to be replaced by calling the controller without anyone being involved to replace those gateways, right? Or to scale up a gateway, you know, when my memory gets slow, right? And so like that kind of automation and self-healing self is what, and planning for failure is what this is all about. And that's yeah. also where control comes into play, right? Because at the same time, only certain things can do that from certain locations, right? And so it's that kind of control, allowing things to happen and allow you to solve those problems, right? Um, but in a way that provides that visibility and control over what's happening in the network and how to redirect traffic and how to change how things are um, being routed on the fly. But it's not really on the fly because here's a scenario where something could go wrong, right? And so I have an event sitting out there looking for that to occur. And when that occurs, have a serverless function go in and do what needs to be done to fix that situation. Oh, and send them send a notification that that took care of it, right? So when I do get a call, you know, in the middle of the night or a Slack notification, I know it's not me, but, you know, I'm able to help diagnose that problem in a minute or two. And I'd much rather them come to me in a minute or two and solve that problem than for them to wait six hours and eventually gets escalated to me. And, you know, the business has been down for four hours. 
because it's something that might not have been on my side, but it could have helped diagnose it, right? And so that that's key. Yeah. Now, I, you guys have talked about a uh, an example where you you were working together, and there was a transit gateway issue and dropping packets. Can you tell me a little bit about that one? I remember hearing about that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's very simple. It's just that you know you have you have um, instances that are running in your VPC, right? And so you have connections that are transiting through a transit gateway, and um, you have going through either a virtual gateway or a transit gateway or a direct connect gateway. Um, a lot of those use on the back end use auto scaling uh, for AWS based on your traffic flow, right? And so what happens is um, as you consume more, you tr get charged more, and they make your your virtual gateway bigger. And, um, and when using less, it auto scales down. Unfortunately, um, when you have a lot of spiky traffic, that can mean that all of a sudden that piece of the tunnel got too small, right? <laughs> and so you dropped packets on the um, on coming in, right? At, or going back out during that auto scaling. And it took us forever to prove that, you know, both sides looked good until we had one of our sister, one of the sister companies actually do the deployment and we're able to then transit through using the transit gateway and actually prove to them so that we could get that, um, that virtual gateway locked open to a, a larger uh, tunnel size until we could upgrade, you know, and actually replace what we had in place with Aviatrix. So, you know, it was, it was great and we had no more drop packets, you know, but we were fighting for six months. Do you remember that, yeah. Ken? Six months. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be surprised how many stories we hear like that. There's a you know major three-letter broadcasting company in New York that says they won't even let AWS back in the building until they stop lying, <laughs> which is which is pretty harsh. But uh, you know, after you have a seven-hour network outage that they're pointing the finger at you, and it turns out to be a problem on their side, you can sort of understand their their perspective there. So. Um, you know, I think we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour here. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, we, we talk a little bit about some of the services that Victor Davis uh, has the ability to deliver, uh, Jen. So maybe we, we, we can talk about that for a few minutes. And then uh, I think there's been several questions. Hopefully everybody's been getting their questions answered uh, via online, because uh, I don't think we're going to have time to go through a whole bunch of question and answer. But let me turn it over to Jen to talk about some of the services you guys can provide to these folks. Right. Uh, thanks, Rod. So um, at Victor Davis, we have both a, a consulting arm for which we provide um, consulting in uh, data foundation, which is uh, traditional master data management, analytics and governance. And then we also have an analytics ML and AI practice. But more importantly, um, on uh, the cloud side, uh, we have a managed service offering where we provide um, a managed service of the Aviatrix offering for small and mid-sized companies where we host uh, controller and transit gateways um, so that when uh, companies or small, smaller organizations want to get started in the cloud, they can start um, leveraging our managed service offering and we take care of the networking for them if they don't have that expertise to connect it in. And then as they grow, um, then we help migrate them into their own enterprise uh, version of, into their own accounts of Aviatrix. Additionally, for larger uh, companies, we have a managed service practice where um, with uh, customers that I've worked with, Ken, as well um, as um, to actually manage their Aviatrix and transit networking, DevOps uh, deployments in the cloud in their own accounts um, as well. So providing that um, 24 by seven um, support. And one of the things I, I love to say, you know, to, to my general manager, he's like, are you worried about providing around the sun coverage uh, um, for transit networking? I'm like, nah, it's Aviatrix. I got that all scripted. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's one of those, those great things is having something that um, you can rely on that gives you that visibility. I'm not worried about it calling us in the middle of the night. What I really worry about is what's on the other side, right? And when you have a partner, you know, um, 
like I've had with Ken and at some of the enterprise customers on that other side. I know they've got their side, you know, as much as they can, because it's outsourced as well on-prem um, in hand, but giving them that visibility in the cloud is, you know, has always been key. And that's one of the great things uh, with our partnership with Aviatrix is providing that complete visibility in the cloud. And uh, yeah. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank uh, Jen and Ken both. Uh, very informative. It's great to hear the perspective from both of you. We could have clearly gone on for another hour. Um, so maybe we'll do it again and, and pick up where we left off. But, yeah, I um, realized I was talking on mute earlier. I was going <laughs> to. Oh, we, don't, we heard you the whole time. Uh, to, to close, uh, I want to pop up a. Um, a quick poll, if anybody can uh, please go through the, uh, the poll. Katie, if you can uh, pop up the poll so everybody can uh, take a look at that. And while you're doing the poll, I'll give you just uh, some background on things that you could do next. Um, certainly, if you have any questions, you can reach out to uh, Victor Davis or info at aviatrix.com and we'll connect back to you guys and, and answer any questions that you have. Uh, you can get to our docs. We publish them online at docs.aviatrix.com. You can also get questions answered very easily if you're on our website and you want to use our little chat guy at the bottom. Um, we also do architectural sessions if you're interested in going into more of an architectural discussion to find out uh, you know, how we would work in, in your particular environment. And then I also encourage you to get ACE certified, the Aviatrix Certified Engineering. We actually have started that now online courses, self-paced. Uh, so find out more information about that at aviatrix.com slash ACE. Uh, and we encourage you to do that. That's, that course is not just about Aviatrix, but actually about cloud networking in general and goes into cloud networking in AWS, in Azure, in Google, and in Oracle, and then how we bring together a lot of that. So it's, it's a good one day course to get you started if you've got interests in, in what, what's going on out there with us. But with that, I'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. Thank you again, Ken and Jen, uh, for participating. And please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you've got questions or found any of this interesting. Thanks, Katie, if you can close us out. <laughs>